are so excited to see you and so excited about tonight, because tonight we are going to be celebrating the role that San Francisco has played in the sound of modern electronic music. Now, there are other cities that claim like a musical genre, like Detroit with techno and Chicago with house music, but it's the Bay Area that has provided the instruments, the technology behind those instruments that have shaped those genres and also been part of so many hits through the 80s and beyond that I'm sure you're familiar with. Yes, and these techniques were pioneered by a Bay Area, Bay Area collective of composers, musicians, engineers, and instrument designers, many of whom blurred the lines between those roles. The legacy of their work continues to inspire new generations of musicians, and we have two people tonight from that collective. And uh, the first, John Chowning, is a composer, musician, and professor known for his discovery of FM synthesis at Stanford, where he founded the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. And Suzanne Chani's with us, five-time Grammy-nominated composer, electronic music pioneer, neoclassical recording artist, who's released over 20 albums, including Seven Waves and Velocity of Love. So please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Gosh, it is so great to be able to meet you both in person. Mark has told me so much about you, John, and of course he's the person who pitched the show that I did with Suzanne Chani and really turned me on to the history of synth, to electronic music, and the role that San Francisco has played in it. But Suzanne, I gotta ask you, what brought you to the Bay Area? Because it was not electronic music. <laughs> No, I was, uh, I was just lucky because it was uh, a complete change in my life. So I had grown up in the East Coast. I had gone to a women's college. I had a very traditional education. And then I came out to UC Berkeley to get a master's in music composition. And uh, things just seemed to be going normally. And then the free speech movement happened. The riots happened. The Vietnam War happened and I met Don Buchla. Wow, so your core instrument was the piano, right? At yes. That time. And did you know that there was experimentation going on when you got here around you know, new musical forms, techniques, compositions? Not at all. I was just guided by some unseen light, really, <laughs> to get here because it was not only did I meet Don Buchla, but I met John Chowning. Wow. 1969, I got here in 68. 69, I was studying with John at Stanford and uh, with the father of computer music, Max Matthews, and uh, that was a stunning opportunity. Yeah. John, when did you come here to the Bay Area? I <coughs> arrived from Paris in 1962. 1962, so remind me what you were doing in Paris. So, after the Korean War, which I served on an aircraft carrier, I went to Wittenberg College in Ohio. Then, as many composers of the day did, I went to Paris to study with Nadia Boulanger. I was there for three years with her. So classical music composition. Yeah, learning to hear. That's what she taught. Hear lines. Yeah. And in 1961, I was there 59 to 62. In 1961, I heard a piece by Karlheinz Stockhausen, Kontakte, for four channels, quadraphonic, and it really got in my head. And I thought, rather than just rotational movements, I would love to have spatial, be able to write for loudspeakers and create spatial motions and free forms. Right, for loudspeakers and create spatial. Yeah. So then you came here not with that plan, but with that hope? With that hope. And Stanford had no interest in electronic <laughs> music at that time. So I was frustrated. Then in 1964, Max, well, he published in no November 1963 uh, an article, the first exposition outside of Bell Labs 
of the idea of using computers to make music. That's defined the digital domain. And that got in my head. And John, I was curious if you were familiar at all with the San Francisco Tate Music Center at that time. Yeah, yeah when I arrived, I performed often there with Don Buchla, with uh, Raymond Sender, Pauline Oliveros, yes. these icons of... Yeah, what were those early performances like? They were pretty far out <laughs> <laughs> and exciting. I mean, Cage was a very important figure in the aesthetic of the day. And uh, so there was a great interest. In fact, Cage came there, they did his piano concerto, I, I forget which one. Did it draw very big audiences? I'm sorry? Did it draw very big audiences? Oh yeah, For, it was on Divisadero Street at that point, Tate Music Center, and uh, yeah, it was interesting. And so eventually the Tape Center moved to Mills, and that's when you became affiliated with the Tape Center, right? Exactly, so I was at Berkeley, and Mills was next door and I found out about it, and by then it was really very private. Um, technically, it wasn't part of Mills, but it was housed there, and technically you paid $5 an hour, but nobody ever collected money, and uh, there was nobody there. I could stay up all night with candles and making music on the instruments, and they had the very first Buchla. The first Buchla 100 was there, and they had a Moog, uh, but I was, always drawn to the book club. Well, I love the mode too, but. <laughs> well, Suzanne, do you remember the first time you really heard the sounds of the book club or what the book club's potential was? My first, ex you know, epith epiphany of this type of music, yours with a, a Stockhausen piece, and mine was at MIT, hmm. my brother college, when I was at Wellesley. And we went one, my music class, which was about five people, uh, went to MIT one evening for a kind of social get together. And there was a professor there using his entire budget to get a sound out of the computer. And this was, you know, not a, an official work. He was using it on the side. So none of this was mainstream at all. And he did make a sound, and I heard that sound, and that was that. Mm -hmm. I said, now I know this exists. Yeah. And it was life-changing, right? You don't even know what it is. Yeah, it's so new. And also at the same time, for the few who did kind of know what it was, were trying to create instruments, boxes, things that could create that kind of music, there weren't a lot of women, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> You've got some crazy stories about being one of very few women or the only woman who was really drawn to the bukla and also working to construct them. Yes. Do you want to share any stories about those early days? I remember when we chatted about uh, having to fight to be able to be taught how to play it, F yeah. fight to keep your job, I think, mean, at one point as well. Well, you know, I'm back here now, you know, in this area, but I was in New York for 20 years. And when I was here um, and I met Don Buchla, when I finished graduate school, I said, okay, that's where I belong. And I went to work for him. I talked myself into getting a job. And the day, the first day, at the end of the day of soldering, he fired me. <laughs> right. And... I said, why are you firing? He said, there's a cold soldering joint and it must be the new girl. And I said, that's not fair. You have no proof. And of course, I didn't know how to solder. <laughs> I really <laughs> didn't. <I> just like <laughs> but anyway, I just came back the next day. Like he had not even. Like he just <laughs> had never happened. I love that. I said, you can't fire me. And that was the truth. <laughs> So you, you were at Berkeley, but were there collaborations with, with Stanford, for example? Yes. So, yeah, I got to Berkeley in 68. In 69, there was a summer program with John Chowning at the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory up on the hill there in Stanford. And it was, for us, we, we had to be there at 5 in the morning 
it was a real struggle. Do you remember? Because the computers were so limited, and you had to book your, you know, your time slots, and we were not important because we were music. And so we got not the greatest time slot. <laughs> and uh, you know, we would get up before the sun rose, and I had a friend, Walter. Do you remember Walter's last name? Walter Hewlett? No. no. Anyway, this I had a buddy who would do the driving. And we'd get up early and we'd drive to Stanford and uh, do this class that ended at like 7 a.m. Because there was basically very limited number of computers or just one that you could access, essentially? One big computer that was time-shared. And since I was not funded, I was allowed to use the computer nights after midnight and early mornings at any time. Wow. Wow. So I talked John McCarthy, who was the director, into letting us have this summer workshop as long as we were done by the time the funded researchers arrived. Wow. And that's how we did it. But we got stuff done, and we were all passionate about it. But it was not real time. Sometimes we'd have to wait for, you know, 10 minutes to hear, like, 10 seconds of sound. Something you didn't put it, it would take that long yeah, to yeah. process. So while you're waiting, you're thinking, <laughs> what if? If I expect to hear this, and I don't, then I'll do this. So it was an engagement that was intense, and it was a habit which I maintain until this day. Mm -hmm. Think carefully before you do it. Turn the, make the sound. <laughs> Gives a different perspective on latency. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, John, I've read about a group that's called the Breakfast Club. I think some people might know it as the Dead Presidents Society. Um, and for anybody that is interested in this, I suggest you go to YouTube and look up a documentary on the Dead Presidents Society. Um, can you tell us about these meetings? Who was there and what kinds of things you would well, discuss? Everyone was, I mean, Don was there, <coughs> uh, Tom Oberheim, Roger Lynn. Max would come. Max. Max Matthews. Uh, anyone who, it's Serge uh, Cherupnin. Mm -hmm. I mean, people who were involved and because it was a very small community. No one, the, the world of popular music was not had not bought into anything having to do, except switch on Buck. Mm. That was the Did Dave the Smith big one. ever come? Sorry? Dave Smith. Yeah, Dave yeah, Smith. Dave yeah, Dave Smith. Another local hero. Yeah. 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 What kinds of topics would you discuss at these? Say again? What kinds of topics would you discuss at these meetings? All sorts of things. You know, some technology, some just personal, you know, associations and what we're doing, what we're interested in. Yeah. I, I would go to those meetings um, at, for a period. I did go. Again, it was morning. It was like 7 in the morning. Yeah. Not easy to get there from where I lived. Mm. But They it was, were up all night. No, I'm just they kidding. were up all night, right, <laughs> working with the computers. Uh, but it was fun. But all of those people shared because they were all, uh, s they all had startup companies. You know, Don Buchla, Tom Oberheim, uh, Dave Smith, they, and Roger Lynn, they were all the, the beginnings of manufacturing these new instruments. And at one point or another, they all seem to have lost their companies. Mm. Thus, I think, dead presidents. <laughs> uh, you know, they were all bought out and then restarted again. Mm -hmm. And so, John, the invention of FM synthesis has been in attributed to you. Uh, you say it was a discovery. And so I'm wondering, can you tell us about this discovery? What was that process like for you? And you know, when you made the discovery, did you have any idea of how groundbreaking it would be? No, I didn't. <laughs> and uh, it, I found something I wasn't looking for. I was looking for tones that would separate themselves from the reverberant field. And one way to do that is small changes in frequency. So as a kid, I knew, learned vibrato on the violin. So I knew, so I was changing the rate of vibrato. And at some point I realized 
I'm not constrained to, you know, how fast my finger, but I could go up and down 10 times per second, 100 times per second. And at some point I realized I was hearing a complex tone done with a very simple computational means. Now that was a long night because <laughs> for every change, little change, I had to wait, as I said before, right. and 10 minutes, 20 minutes, depending on the computer load on this timeshare machine. But it was a very rich experience. Can I say, I love that you do the universal sign for vibrato. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I play the cello and I do the same thing. <laughs> anyway. Well, right now we're going to hear a 10 minute musical piece composed by you, John, that utilizes some of these FM synthesis techniques. Uh, would you like to say a few words yeah. about it? So Terranus is the piece we'll hear. And it's an anagram of nature's. Why? After eight years of learning, research, and development of frequency modulation synthesis and theory involving mathematics and Bessel functions beginning in 1964, I presented Terranus in the spring of 1972. The work was the realization of a dream as it included all I had learned from the patient researchers at the Stanford AI lab four-channel surround sound, moving sounds in an imaginary space, and fully developed FM. But its discovery in 1967, which I just described, was straightforward, a discovery of the ear. I had no background in math or technology, but my well-trained ear heard something no one else could hear or even imagine in the day complex tones that were remarkably simple for a computer to produce. The Bessel functions and mathematics explain FM, but are nowhere present in its production. FM is a gift of nature, hence Terranus.
John. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know that I've listened to a piece of music like that, especially not in what you described as quadraphonic, a quadraphonic speaker arrangement. Both you and Suzanne like to work in that. But, but why? What is it about that arrangement in particular? Well, we can create an illusory space. You know, in other words, we can hear sounds that you just, uh, that are beyond the walls in which we find ourselves. So we can create di understanding distance cue and how to, how to make these projections that become magical, for me at least. And I assume since I'm the same species as everyone else, that is at least one other person who understands it's the same. And I thank you for your applause. <laughs> but so it's, it's a magical uh, medium to be able to create sounds and, and illusions that can't be otherwise experienced. Yeah. I love that. I, I also love that. I don't know if the KQED Commons has ever been used in that way before. <laughs> so it's nice that we are, are getting to bring that experience here. Yeah. Suzanne, I'm so curious what you, what you feel like that four channel surround sound creates. Well, you know, I was proselytized by Don Buchla and I grew up on quad because he realized from the beginning that this is a type of sound that had no location in nature, right? It wasn't like a violin that was in front of you and that's where it belonged. It was essentially a monophonic sound that didn't have its own, you, you had to create the space for it. Yes. And uh, he considered spatial movement one of the primary parameters. You know, when you do this type of music, you, you think in the parameters of sound. You know, what is the frequency? What is the amplitude? What is the filter characteristic? What is, and all of these parameters that mold the sound can be, in his system, voltage controlled, which means that you can shape them the same way John was talking about using FM, you know, in a way to manipulate sound. And it, you don't have to be able to do it physically. Yeah. It's, it's a voltage. It can go beyond what you can do physically. So I can play notes faster than Paderewski. Uh, okay. Uh, in fact, in the legacy of uh, classical contemporary music, which became more and more complex, you know, as composers tried to impress their audiences with difficulty, you know, this made difficulty easy. But I'm getting away from quad. So quad was voltage controlled. And so I've always been moving the sound in space and creating imaginary spaces. Is the, is the object uh, creating theaters that can present this type of music is essential. And we still don't have the tools. Even I don't have the tools that I had in the 70s, 60s and 70s. You know, Don had a voltage-controlled reverb. Mm -hmm. wow. So you could move the sound near, far, near, far. You know, you could control it. That doesn't even exist right now. Mm. So we're, we're getting there. Yeah. You know, Mark, I should remind listeners, we're going to have a brief question and answer period for the audience to be able to ask questions of um, John and Suzanne before Suzanne's performance. So you can start thinking about some of those questions now. John, now that we're talking about FM synthesis, you know, I have to bring up Yamaha. That was my introduction to FM synthesis. When did Yamaha recognize the commercial potential of this discovery? They recognized early because they were already experimenting with digital control of, of organs. And so they were aware of the digital domain like every other manuf instrument manufacturer. And they, over a period of eight years, from 1972, from nine years until 1983, when the DX7 hit the market and changed the world of, mm -hmm. of music forever. 
I'm going to say that the DX7, well, I became the face of the DX7. But in fact, the DX7 was the work of about 100 really good engineers at Yamaha. And while I went there to work with those engineers over a period of uh, 10 years or so, and told them everything I knew, how I heard things, and uh, it really is uh, it's a tribute to those, those people. And it democratized music until the DX7 mm -hmm. with 16 simultaneous voices and a cartridge on which could read and write information that plug, plugged in the DX7. One could produce in Singapore a tone that the next 24 hours later could be in Paris. So the play with the parameter exchange, the parameters what, which Suzanne described, but now in the digital domain, was a force that no one anticipated. The DX7 was backordered for two years, and all its little brothers and became the most synth uh, successful synthesis engine in the history of electronic music. Yeah, it was, it was such a powerful synth engine, and I know that it also has a reputation as being, you know, an 80s synth, right? It's, it's used on countless hits. So, you know, how does it feel that a lot of what people, what the synth is known for is, are the preset sounds? Do you feel like there were people there that, um, that didn't quite get the full experience of FM synthesis through it? Some. But there became a sub-industry of super programmers. Mm -hmm. People like David Bristow and Gary Lewenberger, David Bristow from UK and Gary from San Francisco, uh, became people who could program for, for big rock bands like in the UK. I mean, all of them. Tina Turner was put out her first, her first album after she separated from her abusive partner. This wonderful album she makes use of the DX7 in very, very powerful ways. And of course, everyone else did. I mean, it became the sound of the 80s into the 90s, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love... Uh, uh, Africa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, photo. Yeah. Africa. 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 <laughs> um, There's a tune everyone knows. Yeah, I, I I love how you describe it as democratizing, because it sort of is such a juxtaposition with what you were saying earlier, Suzanne, about how musicians and people who create music so often want to emphasize the difficulty, and I can do this, <laughs> or you cannot, and it feels like that is actually um, a common thread between the two of you is really making this kind of music accessible. I mean, I think about how you really made your synthesizer sounds mainstream. I mean, you pushed it into the mainstream in part because you also needed to, to be able to survive. Yeah, you needed to make, make some money. Yeah. But, but was that part of the driving force for you? Making money? No, <laughs> <laughs> making, it, making it mainstream, making well, it accessible. You know, from my, my mental state at that time, was that <laughs> I already thought it was every, every place. Yeah. You know, for me, I was just amazed that I would go out there and nobody knew about it. It's like, what? You don't know about this? I mean, so I, I encountered this, like, vacuum that surprised me because I had come from this little, you know, womb here, you know, where everybody understood it. You know, Bukla, John, and yeah. all the folks here. And then I go out into the world, and, and there was a big gap. So, um, yeah, my mission was always to cross that divide and to educate. I became an educator just socially because I so desperately wanted people to be able to understand it because I think that's what creates a listening we can't hear something that we don't understand. It, it's a strange thing. So now there is a listening for this music. I have audiences that make this music at home, and they 
they know how to play the instruments and they know what I'm doing. And it's like I had to wait 40, 50 years for that to happen, but it's I'm so happy that I'm still alive and can experience that. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, so John put out, you know, the FM synthesis that became the foundation of the sound of the 80s, and you were the sound of the 80s in so many ways. I actually want to play some of your, your commercial work that will be familiar to anybody who grew up in, in the 80s, like the uh, Coca-Cola clip. Coca-Cola pop and pour. <laughs> or uh, Atari. Atari video games. <laughs> and uh, one of my favorites, the, this PBS clip. Okay, that's a cop story. Stay tuned to the Cop. Find out. Three Ten seconds there. Stand by. Stand by. Roll tape two. In five. Ready? Four. Roll tape three. Okay. Two. One. I wonder if anyone in the audience knows that. That's from Inside Story. Yeah. <laughs> well. They don't make them like that anymore. No, <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> Do you get it? Is it still? I don't know. What is it like for you to hear that still today? It reminds me of the days, you know. And I lived in New York. The energy was high. I ran a very intense studio. It was like an emergency room. You know, people would call and say, we need this by tomorrow. And I had all the tools, you know, this, this Synclavier, this digital workstation. Uh, you know, we weren't using computers yet, portable computers. So it was very primitive, but also very possible to do mm. what I did, yeah. John, s synthesizers and the sounds that they make, y you could say that they're... No, they're not just mainstream now, but they are kind of the default sound, right? And I think a lot of young people nowadays, it's just second nature for them to go to the computer when they want to make music. And so I was wondering how it feels for you to have played a role in that, and if you f are happy with kind of the current state of, of music and, and how young people are producing music. Well, <clears throat> electronic music as a as a term now embraces popular music. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas back in the day, electronic music was Stockhausen, Cologne School. And uh, so it's, it's humbling in a way, but we have a son as, who's a, a very good jazz pianist and friend, classical French horn. He tells me what to listen to. He says, listen to Meshuga. And I <laughs> say, Meshuga. Why? And then he t puts it on and explains. So, you know, he's one of these people who's on the bridge between what was and what is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I, he says, you know, dubstep. <laughs> dubstep, every dance, every dance dancer <laughs> who goes into a club, knows about dubstep. And uh, so it's become a part. So s FM synthesis be has become like the set, like a sine wave. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's in all the studios. Everyone uses it because it's easy. And with a small parameter space, there's a huge timbral space. And uh, that gives a lot of power. So it's not linear. You make a small change and you can be in a somewhat different part of the universe in the sound of, of sound. Wow. I also have to ask you about CARMA, uh, the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. Uh, what led you to founding CARMA at Stanford and you know, what are you hoping it will continue to advance? So we were instrumental in Boulez's formation of IRCOM in Paris. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when they formed IRCOM, we formed Karma. Although my work had begun in 1964, Karma was founded as an institution within the School of Humanities Department of Music 
in 1974 to be able to have our own institution, our own access to, to funding uh, options like NSF and, and uh, National Health, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Because the music department knew nothing about funding research and we, so we had this institution that was in, independent of, of the kind of small scale workings of the music department. And uh, Karma then helped Ulez define his projects. And this all goes back to a composer named Jordi Ligeti, who, uh, who was at Stanford in 1972 for, nine, for nine, uh, five months. On leaving, he told Boulez, for whom, who had a lot of respect for, for Ligeti, he said, pay attention to what's going on in computer music at Stanford because Car Boulez was planning a big analog studio and they had no, no idea about the domain, uh, digital domain. Mm. So it was a Ligeti's little comment to Boulez changed the whole trajectory of IRCOM's formation. Wow, yeah. I did not know about the Ligeti yeah. connection to Stanford. That's a whole story. It's another day. And they were funded by the French government, so yeah, you know yeah, it was a you, very it's happy the most thing. Funded yeah. institutional research in the world by far. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I learned a lot of name, new names tonight. <laughs> I have to say, um, I, I sort of started out by saying that the Bay Area's contribution is the instruments and the technology behind the instruments. But when you think about the Bay Area's legacy with regard to electronic music, computer music, analog. Um, modulate, modulators, I think. I, I, I guess, would you, would you add to that? What more would you say besides the instruments and the technology behind those instruments as the Bay Area's contribution in all of this? Well, I think you've just pointed out to two just incredibly deep and rich and universal sources of music here. One is the analog design that was going on here, and the other is the digital. I mean, those are two frontiers at the time that, you know, spread out. I mean, we did have in the analog world, you know, they, they make up this East Coast, West Coast paradigm, you know, that Moog was on the East Coast and Buchla was on the West Coast. But the differences were not as, you know, emphasized, and, you know, and then in the end they became friends, and in the end, I accepted Moog as, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we were more compartmentalized in those early days. Uh, you know, every instrument designer thought that's the only instrument you need. They shouldn't talk to each other and you shouldn't use, you know, everything was different. And then, you know, Dave Smith designed MIDI. Dave Smith, this local guy, created a languaging to connect instruments across the frontier of, you know, manufacturers. Mm. So you could connect them all. That was, that was huge. Mm. And you could talk to a computer with MIDI. You know, this was life changing. So all that happened out here and I hadn't even realized it until tonight. I wasn't paying attention <laughs> to the regional, you know, advancement of this, you know, because it, it's, you know, I just wasn't, I w hadn't conceptualized it sure. that way. But thank you for letting Well, you were that. busy making your music. Yeah. I as Mark described it to me uh, when he told me about you as, as making these sounds lush and romantic and, and really wonderful to listen to. So we're going to listen to it in a moment. But I want to give the audience a chance, if you have questions, to please feel free to answer, uh, ask your questions. You can raise your hand. There are... Uh, Paloma and Yoan have microphones on the floor, so. I see one hand up in the center. Uh, hello, Hi. thank you so much Thanks. so far. Uh, I've, I've heard Mr. John Chowning. I have two questions, actually. Um, at, when you were describing the, the time you discovered FM synthesis, 
you said something about isolating a tone in a reverberant field. What does that mean exactly? And what were you trying to do then? So the distance cue is one of these cues that every mammal and in fact every living animal is very, very aware of. We're not in our daily lives because we're surrounded by, by electrification. But a hundred years ago, people lived half, well, for 250,000 years, Homo sapiens spent half his time on average in the darkness. So the distance cue was very, very important, but it was undefined. And I spent much time thinking about how to define the distance cue. So if you have a tone, boo, and you have in a reverberant environment, the reverberation and the, that tone don't distinguish themselves. But the distance cue is dependent upon the ratio between the, the direct signal and the reverberant signal. So the vibrato is one way to make that difference. So that was the beginning of my exploration when I found something I wasn't looking for. Hmm. Mm. Any questions? Good question. Thank you. <clears throat> um, we take for granted so much these days around how things um, have become so simple and easy. But something that struck me, you said about the professor you were going to see was trying to make a computer make a sound. Mm -hmm. And I never really thought about that before. And so I'm curious, back then, what did it take to get to the point of just making the first sound from a computer? Suzanne, I think you had said that. Yes, I did. It was like, but maybe John had a better <laughs> answer that, for that because, uh, you know, all I, I recall from the time is that uh, com computers were being judged by their uh, speed and their computing power. And how could you demonstrate computing power? And one of the demonstrations was uh, to make a sound, which took a certain amount of power. And reverberation was a huge consumption of power. And uh, you know that was a big advance because mm -hmm. there wasn't enough computing power. I mean, you, that's why you had to wait overnight for this uh, result. The DX7 changed the world. The cost of the analog systems like that she did her work with, for examples, cost many thousands of dollars. I don't which, know. Which systems? Well, like that you were using in New York. Until the mini Moog, everything well, I, was... I had one Synclavier that cost $200,000. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. all of a sudden, a yeah. DX7 <laughs> for $2,000, which was in the domain of a high school student who had a bicycle route <laughs> and could save and save and save and ask one for Christmas. Yeah, wow, <laughs> but but uh, that broke the mold. Yeah. So all of a sudden, things were inexpensive. And as I said, until then, it was integrated all circuits, right? computer music was the province of big institutions like Bell Labs, Stanford AI Lab, MIT. MIT. But wasn't it us. the integrated circuit that yeah. came in and allowed yeah. all this? Yeah, so it was yeah. a major breakthrough. I wish I didn't have to stop the Q&A here, but I will tell folks that uh, after Suzanne's performance, um, they will be here. There will still be the demos in the lobby as well, so there'll be some time to ask other follow-up questions if you have them. But let, let's, let's hear a performance by Suzanne Chani. Yeah. Okay. Um, because it's time. You were wonderful tonight. They were wonderful. It's going to include Suzanne walking us through her equipment. But do you want to say anything about what we'll be hearing? Oh, before oh yes. OK. So um, all right. So as some of you know, I took a hiatus from performing on the Bukla. Uh, so I did it in the 60s and 70s and had uh, you know some disasters. My instrument was stolen. It broke. Uh, I couldn't find theaters to perform in. And so I just 
And then, you know, the DX7 came along. And, uh, you know, the Japanese companies and Roland and Korg and everybody, and the whole industry shifted. And I went into more music production and left my dream of live performance of the Bukla. Well, here I am, back again. And now what is the difference between what I'm doing now and what I did then? Uh, the instrument, you know, if you saw some of the early pictures, is more compact now because it has a digital element. Uh, but oddly, I'm using the same raw materials that I used in the 70s. So at one point I got a, I got a grant from the National Endowment of the Arts, a composer grant, and to satisfy it I had to write a paper. So I wrote a paper on how to play the bukla, and nobody cared. <laughs> and it just went into, you know, the dust. But then 40 years later, I said to myself, how did I play the bukla? <laughs> and I took out this paper that I call the bukla cookbook, and it's up on my website, you can get it. And I, it, it documented a performance. And it started with uh, the four 16 ta stage sequences that I'm using tonight. And it also documented a lot of techniques because coming from a classical background, I, you know, I had always, always experienced the world of performance instruments, piano even, you know, that's what I played, as instruments that had techniques. So you had pizzicato on strings, or you had, you know, the bowing, and you had arpeggios on the piano, and you had, there were things that were pianistic, violinistic, harpistic, you know, things that that instrument did, and I went to discover what does this instrument want to do? What can it do? And so I read the paper, and it got me back into the realm that I had been in. And so that's what I'm playing tonight, is improvisation on four sequences. It's completely different. We won't go into that because the tools are different. The instrument is not the same. Yeah. Yeah. Well, looking forward to hearing okay. that. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I've been asked just to s say a note about what I'm playing tonight. This is the Bukla 200E. The E stands for this new kind of hybrid system. Uh, what I played was the 200, which was pretty much pure analog. Um, it's not a, a pure 200E because I missed some of the earlier modules and I had them uh, cloned. <laughs> That's okay in about 10 minutes. That'll be okay. <laughs> so, um, this is the MARF. You'll see me putting a lot of attention on this module. And this is a module that I used in the day, and I'm a big fan of it, and I'm trying to get it remanufactured now. Uh, the spatial processor is the 227E, and this is, as I said, I mean, I played in quad from the beginning because that was a Buchla, uh concept, that this should be the sound should be moving. So that is still pretty much the same. I also have uh, my new toy on this iPad. It's an Animog. And it's like, you know, I mean, it's so wonderful for touring because it's so light and, you know, <laughs> powerful. Uh, then I have these two iPads that are interfaces for the processing. So there are two H9s, Eventide H9. Eventide is a company that goes way back to the 60s too. And my H9s have been modified to fit in with the Buchla, so they're in Buchla modules. I have a custom-made module that has a sequencer that's uh, dedicated to spatial movement. Nothing too fancy, uh, you know, but but I needed it, you know? <laughs> and this is 
the keyboard. So it's not a mechanical keyboard, which was considered the enemy. <laughs> As Buchla would say, an inappropriate interface. <laughs> so, you know, even though I was a pianist, I didn't touch the piano for years, all those years, you know. Anyway, this is a beautifully designed keyboard, which is really um, not a keyboard. It is a control center. It's a, you program the keys to do certain things. And so that's very useful in performance. So the idea about, uh, the other thing about this instrument is it has a lot of feedback. Because Don Buchla, unlike any other designer at the time, was aware of the performance potential. You know, to make an instrument with an interface, the connective, you know, that connects the human to the machine, so that it could be performed. This feedback system tells me what's going on. So I can interact with the machine in a very hopeful way, I guess. <laughs> okay, so um, I hope you enjoy this. And uh, let's see, why is that moving? Okay, here we go.
The brilliant Suzanne Chani. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Thank you also to John Chowning, the legendary John Chowning, our Bay Area pioneers. And uh, also thank you to the KQED live team, to the audio and tech people for tonight's amazing performance. And also a very big round of applause to Noise Pop and to Mission Sense for sponsoring this event. Their Mission Sense, the demos are still gonna be up until 9 p.m. So please enjoy and uh, thank you all for coming. Good night, everybody. Good night, thank you. I'm gonna get off this way, thank you.